we do have a URL uh, for the uh, code samples that we uh, are presenting today. So of course, everybody's going to go right to that. Um, uh, you can also type them. No one's going? OK, well, I have a wire here, which I still think is a really important thing. But then again, I had 14 gigabit ports in my basement before I moved. Um, so, but the uh, wires are good. Uh, but this is a URL you can use later um, to uh, see the example code. So don't feel like you have to type these things in if you don't want to. Um, but saying that, we're uh, going to go right into a quick demo. Uh, and the first thing is that we're going to be, we're going to be in terminal. So I'm at the command prompt. And uh, for those of you completely new to, to um, the command line um, uh, or Python, uh, you just want to get to the terminal, and we're, we're going to use that command prompt to type Python. I'll do that right now. And you get a little bit of information uh, to show which version of Python you're using uh, and how it was compiled uh, and some little uh, extra information about uh, some things you can do, like typing help, because uh, Python does have a command that we'll talk about. Uh, but the first thing I'm going to do is find my cursor. And I'm going to type string one equals hello world. And I'm going to press return. And that is setting up a variable that equals to equals the text hello world. And now I'm going to type print string one. And I'm going to and the string one is enclosed in parentheses. I'm going to press return. And just like it says, prints hello world. So that's your first Python if, you've done, if you wanted to follow along. Now, there's some other interesting things you can do with Python. We're going to get into more details about that. And I'll just show you one little one. Um, we have that string variable, string one. I'm actually going to multiply that times three. This is one of the fun things I like to do with, with text when I'm really bored. Multiply it. Um, and now I've taken that that string one variable and I printed it out three times. So there, there is a little example of some of the power of Python, some things you can do if you've had any basic math. Hey, you can multiply strings. Uh, so if you've tried that out, you've done your first bit of Python. And we'll go back to slides. Nate. So no need to be afraid. I um, got into Python just, uh, well, mainly because Greg Nagel badgered me into it a little bit. But, um, you know, I was using Bash for everything, and I wasn't amazing at Bash, and I'm still not amazing at Python, but they're both great scripting languages, and Python is one that I've started to settle on because it's a lot more reusable uh, than Bash is for me. Some of the things it does that are really nice is in Bash, you have to worry about escaping symbols and spaces and all that other junk, and do you have the right quotes and... You know, are you doing that properly? Python handles all that for you, for the most part. So you can just feed it a string in quotes with spaces, symbols, whatever, and it does the right thing the majority of the time. Um, it's very easy to reuse code. So when you've written something, you can just uh, take it, import it into another project, and you know you can build little pieces at a time, and eventually you'll find yourself with a management tool, maybe like Monkey or something like that. Um, and there's no need to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of libraries and modules out there that uh, have a lot of functionality that are pre-made. You know, batteries included, as they say, I guess. And it just works. You import it, use it, and you're on your way. Now, one of the things that's not so good, um, but you know, there's an easy way around it, which we're going to go over later, is you cannot just use Bash and Python directly. You have to shell out to it or uh, wrap it in another uh, Python library or module, and um, it's fairly straightforward, but you know, we'll get to that in a little bit. It's different from command prompt. Like if you're doing inner, inner, uh, the Python interpreter, you can't just you know, CD into a directory and fiddle with some things, and then CD into another directory and fiddle with some things. You can. It's just a little bit more uh, verbose than uh, bashes. So you know, working with it is a little bit different mindset, but once you get the mindset down, it's uh, not so bad at all. OK, so the interpreter, as I said, it's interactive, like bash, except not. So it's you, you take actions upon the full path to things. So instead of seeding into a directory and messing with it, you would take the action on the full path of that thing. Uh, and you generally are you know, very explicit like that the whole time. You don't, you don't want to just uh, do it from your relative path for the most part. You want to be very specific about what it is you're doing. Python is powerful, so you want to be sure you're working on the file you think you're working on. It starts in your current working directory when you fire it up. So when you type Python, it's in your current working directory. Uh, I can't suggest you rely on you know, which directory it started in as a basis for what your 
uh, working on. So you always be, you know, specific, as I said. And inherit your shell environment, so any environment variables you have, you can access those. And as you saw, your command prompt is those uh, three angled uh, brackets. So you want to get your current working directory, you just import OS, which is a module, and you do os.getcwd for current working directory, and then two parentheses there, um, because it's a function. So when you use a function in Python, you always put the parentheses around it. And that'll get you your current working directory, um, you know, up to the folder you're in. The interpreter um, also has the environment variables, as I told you. And uh, if you run this code here, you can import OS, or if you've already imported it, you don't need to import it again. It'll just work, and you can print os.environ. Now, when you do that, or if you do that, it'll be a big jumble of information, because it'll be a list of keys. So it'll be a key value, comma, key value, comma, key value, for all your environment variables. And that's a little bit messy to read. So if you do this for statement here, you can do for k, comma, v, so for a key and a value in os environ items, print that key and that value. And what that does is it puts one key and value on each line, so it makes it a little bit easier to read. And it's useful for, you know, many different things. Uh, anything that comes in key value form, it's, you know, it's a great way to, to iterate through and present it in a usable fashion. PEP8 is the style, um, style standard for Python. And it dictates how you should format it and, uh, you know, how you should handle line length and all those things. For instance, you have indentation levels and in Python the white space matters. So if you have a function or, a, or an if loop or whatever, it must be indented and indented consistently. So PEP says four spaces per indentation level. Um, and, you know, you might want to make sure, it's actually something that tripped me up when I first, doing, first started doing Python. Everyone uses four spaces, and some of the text editors I used do tabs by default. So you, I would, you know, fiddle with a file, try to get it to work. And then it wouldn't run because I had indents, uh, space indents and tab indents, and it doesn't like that. So if you are editing Python files, make sure you have it set to have spaces for your indents and not actual, you know, indent, uh, indents in there. Uh, if you have a long line, use a slash, well, slash to break the line. And uh, when you're using variables and objects, you want to do snake style, they call it. So this is the style. You don't want to do camel with uppercases every other letter. So these are just some guidelines for, um, for how you're doing uh, your code as you're writing it. If you keep it standardized like that, it's a lot easier for people to pick it up. And I like to be ver verbose with my variable names. I don't really like having C equals X dot whatever, because that's confusing. I don't, you know, I'm not going to remember what it is when I go back to it. So it's good to make it as you know, concise, but yet you know, descriptive. Um, indenting applies to code, bo code blocks. So any if statement, any function, anything that you would normally indent like that, and we have examples coming up, you, uh, you must have an indent, otherwise Python won't know what to do with it. You know, it requires the uh, space to be there. And at the end of the block, if you have a regular line thing and then an indent, it doesn't know that block is over until you have another line that's non-indented. So you need to make sure that you end that indent as well. Variables are arbitrary length, so you can have it as long as you want it to be. You know, it gets a little bit cumbersome though if you have something that's more than 80 characters because then you have to wrap just the variable name, which is not, not fun. It can be letters, numbers, and symbols, but it cannot start with a number. It must start with a letter. And some names are reserved, just like in Bash, like for and, uh, you know, if, things of that nature. And values are actually objects, so anything you work with in Python is an object. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll cover that a little bit more in data types as well and show you the power of that and working with the objects. Uh, and, you know, even if it's just a string like the hello, hello world, it has its own, um, uh, methods to it. So you can do stuff to the string unto itself. So you don't need to use another command like awk or grep or anything like that to mess with it. So it's uh, pretty cool. You can, you can do all types of different things with objects just using their own, uh, their own methods. Thank you, Nate. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about data types in Python. And this is one of the first things that sold me on Python when I was, when I was learning about it years ago. Um, so data types, um, in Python are dynamically typed. Uh, that means they are discovered when the script runs. Uh, Python figures out what kind of data you've got where. Um, and the types are always enforced. So uh, if you have um, a particular kind of data, like a string, um, or th that, that contains only numbers and you want to convert it to an integer, uh, you have to do that conversion explicitly. Um, and almost everything is an object, as Nate said. But um, we say that just because we want you to know that that's the case. It's not something you have to worry about when you're starting out with Python. 
um, and for the most part, any time while you're using it uh, as a system administrator. Um, it's very helpful to know that lots of different data types are built into Python. We're going to cover some of the, the uh, basic ones initially, and there's lots more that we can get in that, that uh, we couldn't get into uh, in uh, this particular uh, talk. But um, so when you're working with data types, it's helpful to know what type you're working with. So there's a type command that you can run at the interpreter. And if you put any sort of data inside those parentheses, uh, you can tell what kind of object that is. So if you did and, and uh, if you did uh, the type and just put the number one inside the parentheses, it would tell you that it's an integer. Um, and if you put uh, some quoted text inside, it would tell you that that is a string. Help uh, gives docs on objects. So if you happen to be using Python on a plane, snakes on a plane, um, then uh, and you don't have an internet connection connection, unlike uh, Rich here, uh, who always seems to have an internet connection. Uh, then uh, you can find out this information uh, while you're disconnected. So you can get um, some pretty extensive documentation. A lot of the same kind of thing that you would see on python.org. Because it's all generated from the same source. Uh, so you can do help on a particular object to find out. So uh, you could run help on, on uh, many commands. You could run, run help on that OS module that we imported earlier. Numbers. Uh, the number types in Python, the ones that we would typically uh, deal with as sysadmins uh, include integers. Um, and numbers, and numbers include floating point or decimal numbers. Uh, you'll see the, the floats most often when you're dealing with uh, things that you're pulling from COCO or Objective-C. Uh, so we have an example of that later on when we show you how to get screen resolution. Numbers are not quoted. So if you're used to dealing with numbers in Bash uh, or, or other shell languages, then uh, you just realize that you don't have to quote a number. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just there right uh, in your script uh, with no quote marks around it. Uh, and to find out more about um, uh, numbers, you can do help int. Int is the object type. Um, it'll give you documentation about the integer type and the, the methods or the you know, basically commands that you can run on uh, number types. Uh, you can also find out about floats. That, they give you basically the same, same methods that you can operate. So some examples of things you can do with numbers. And this is where you can follow along a bit. Uh, if you want to type in number 1 equals 7, there you've created your first um, integer variable. Um, we can do number two equals dot two fifty six. Number three equals negative ten twenty four. Those are all uh, the number types in Python. And then you can do things like addition. Uh, we can do comparisons. So we can find that some that uh, you know whether number one is less than number two, uh, or we can find whether number two is equal to number three uh, in these examples. Strings, yes. Yes, I can. Yep. That's two slides. Uh, they are technically two different data types. They are in the look. You can add them together, yep. Uh, because they're part of the overall number type in Python. The number types kind of get converted between each other. So those are the examples, if you need to see those for another moment. And strings are alphanumeric characters, punctuation, white space, or character codes. Uh, they are quoted. Um, basic strings are going to be single or double quoted. Uh, you can also triple quote strings, and that's useful if you have um, text that you want to have line wraps in um, or, other, or, or other white space uh, for indentation, things like that. Um, you'll often see them when you're reading Python code. And one of our goals is to get you to be able to read Python code. Um, we want you to be able to read what's out there if you want to, um, so that you can, you can uh, reuse this uh, in, in your own work. Um, so in Python code that you'll see, you'll uh, have doc strings, um, as they call them, uh, within, your, uh, within the code that's out there. And those doc strings um, are what serves as a source for the uh, help files. And you can get more information about what you can do with strings by doing help str. And here are some examples of strings. We've already done string one in the intro. And there's a triple quoted string, it's three single quotes. And at the end of that string, we have another set of three single quotes. And that has the line wrapping included. And the white space in this case. Question.
It's just to include the, the line feeds and the white space. And then, uh, many of us deal with people who know um, uh, some of the special characters on the Mac by heart. They know the keyboard combinations to get you know, crazy characters, particularly if you've ever worked with people doing creative work. Um, so they may know, you know that op option shift 8 is something and so on and so forth. So we, we may have to deal with Unicode. And Python, uh, Python 2 that's included with OS 10, the version that we'll see on our systems right now, um, supports Unicode, but you have to specifically tell um, strings that you're using Unicode. So you specify that with a U before the string, uh, and then you quote the string, and then we have backslash U, which means I'm doing a Unicode character, uh, and I happen to be using the multiplication sign here. And if you're familiar with the character palette from Edit Special Characters, you've got a U plus zero zero delta seven um, as the character code. You can just pull that code out and put that in your string, um, finish it off. And that creates, uh, when I print this, it creates a string 1024 times 768. So just an example of how you can use special characters if you need to do that in your scripts. And then one of the things I do a lot with Python and my sysadmin uh, work, uh, particularly when I'm going out to um, the syslog or something like that, is I'm using um, uh, string formatting. And there's two different ways to do that in Python. And I just learned the second one pretty recently. And I like both of them, but I'm starting to like the second one. Um, but you use percent and then a character, like percent %s or percent %d, whether you're representing a string or a decimal or something of that sort. Um, there's a lot of information about how to do this out online. Um, but you're using that percent and then a character as a substitution character, and then, you're and then a percent after the string, and then what you're substituting. And what you're substituting, the substitute this goes back into the string. And so it's a, it's a nice way to do variable substitution in strings uh, uh, very quickly. And the second uh, form of this, uh, you're doing something very similar where you've got um, a, char a percent character in the string, um, but you're using a format method um, on that string and then putting the substitution in that. And the nice thing about this is you can have more than one, more than one item in any, in the, uh, in both the string and in the substitution. Yes. Oh yes, it's curly braces. We forgot to fix that. Yeah, it's pr uh, curly braces around the D. Smart quotes. Oh yes, we also wanted to use this slide to point out another typo. As long as we have one. <laughs> we uh, left it in though. It was intentional. We did this one on it purpose. was intentional. The second one's on purpose. Well, let's say both of them are on purpose. Sure, they're both on purpose. Um, so we put smart quotes in this print statement, the second print statement. Um, since you may be working in, in places where you have um, the text, your text editor is smartening the quotes um, uh, instead of dumbification, I guess. Um, the, uh, the smart quotes work, won't work in the uh, Python interpreter. So. If you happen to be copying these exact slides, you would have a problem. Uh, I happen to be a BBEdit user, um, just because I've been using that for 15 years, and I probably use about 5% of the power. And Sublime um, Text, too, is amazing. Um, and if you want to be cheap, Mac Vim, but it's Vim, so, you know. I, you know, I, I'll drop down into, you know, the command line VI as well. Um, but, you know, most of the time I'm doing BB Edit myself. Uh, Text Wrangler is a good alternative if you, you know, if you want to try out BB Edit. We're not talking about Python 3 here. <laughs> <laughs> what okay, came so with your OS? We're, we're what came back? with your OS? Yes, Python 3 does not come with OS 10. It probably so, won't in the foreseeable future. Well, no, I didn't say that. Um, but he, Nate, you might be uh, mentioning the, uh, uh, the parentheses. Is that what you're going to say? No. I had not heard about string formatting, partly because I don't pay attention to Python 3. It's not part of the OS, and almost yeah. everything you're going to be doing with sysadmin scripting, um, you're going to be depending upon the system Python. Um, it's, you know, you, until Apple releases a version of the OS that does not use Python 2 by default, it's kind of dead to me. Well, yeah, well dead to you, too, I guess. <laughs> uh, but it's an important point. There's a, there are some things that you can do in Python 2 that you can't do in Python 3. 
we had actually had a section about that and we decided to get rid of it. So, um, just because it really doesn't exist for all intents and purposes on our clients. So if you want scripts that are going to run on the clients you manage, Python 2 is what you need to target. If you want to plan for machines that don't yet exist, you can write you know, in a format like that as well, by the way. So we're being practical, and I've been accused of being impractical in the past, but this is one place where I'm very practical. So let's go on to lists. Uh, try to get through this presentation. Um, so lists are arrays or sequences. Um, order is important. Um, the thing that comes first is really important because, you know, and the thing that comes second, you know, you need to know what, which, which order things come in. So this is a, you know, any two or three year old learns this, right? Who comes first, who comes last. Um, lists can also contain any other data type and they're denoted by square brackets. So this is one of the places where you just have to know that this is how Python does this. Uh, and, uh, you can get help on, uh, more help on lists and what you can do with them by doing help list or help and then the, the empty brackets. So nothing in between those, those square brackets. Uh, and the reason is that, that those empty square brackets mean this is an empty list. That's an important concept. So we're really ref referring to a list object there. So Booleans are another feature that I think really sold me on, on Python. Um, they didn't have, it, Python didn't have this Boolean data type originally. Uh, before it did, various um, kinds of other data could be treated as true or false, so this table summarizes that. Um, any value except for an empty value was considered true. Um, so now that Python does have a true Boolean data type, uh, the, uh, um, there's, you still have the old rules that apply. Uh, you uh, you kind of get an automatic conversion between the old rules where anything that existed was true and anything that didn't exist was false. Um, there's no no extra conversion necessary. And I just want to point out the last item in the Boolean false column, the none. Uh, that's that's a nice one to know about. If you want to look that up on your own time. Because we all have lots of time. Dictionaries are key value pairs. We are most familiar with this from property lists. Uh, if you've ever dealt with property lists, it's the very same concept. Um, we have keys. The name of the keys are case sensitive. There are no duplicates in a dictionary, so that you can, a key can exist only once. Uh, and any new value that you put in under that same name overwrites the old value. And we use curly braces instead of square braces for that. So dictionary values can also be any data type. You can mix and match those types, and unlike lists, the dictionaries are not ordered. Um, and you can find out uh, more about them by typing help, D-I-C-T. Don't say that, don't try to pronounce that in a, in a presentation. Um, and you can do help and an empty set of curly braces. Yeah, we've, we, we found this out by, you know, testing things out by popping up between cubicles in the office. Don't don't yell out the di. <laughs> Always say dictionary. And neat. So the control logic in Python is very similar to Bash, and uh, I have some examples here, some of the you know more common ones. And uh, there are some other things that are more powerful than Bash logic. I'm not going to get into this a whole lot because they're called list comprehensions if you want to look them up, but they're a little bit more complicated and even confusing to me sometimes. So you don't need to feel bad about being confused about anything Python related because it happens. So for loops, it uses the for reserved keyword, uh, just like in Bash. And uh, you can have an output as an array. And you know, as I mentioned, if you are outputting an array of items in a for loop, which hard to wrap your brain around, uh, it's called a list comprehension and there's like a one line way of doing it. It's really fancy, but you know, as I said, it's a little bit confusing if you're just starting out. So here's a, just a simple loop comparison in Bash. You know, we have a list of models, and we are iterating through it. So we're saying for model in the array, echo the model. In Python, it looks very much the same, except it's actually a little bit less lines. You could condense the Bash one a little bit more. But it's for model and model list, colon, and that's important. You must have the colon at the end of it, print the model. And then if you notice, there's no done or anything like that because the next line that is not indented indicates the end of that code block. So it's just very nice, very concise, does the exact same thing as the one above it. How about if then? Well, Python uses 
if and then else, it's instead of else if or whatever, it's elif, and then else is the final uh, one in this statement. And the first true statement wins. So as soon as it hits something that's true, you know, it fails. And Bash would say if your motivation is greater than zero, you might script all the things. Python, if your motivation is angle bracket greater than zero, then you might script all the things. And as you can see, it's very similar. I think the Python's a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier to read. Um, and uh, if you're just writing simple stuff, you could have you know less lines of code and easier to read. Uh, you know, even for simple things. Case, there's no real case statement in Python as such. You know, there isn't bash. Instead, you use the if, elif, else structure to accomplish the same thing. So let's see what it looks like in bash. In bash, it says, all right, so we have a, a variable model. We're looking for MacBook Air, MacBook Pro, Mac Pro, or, you know, something else. And that's the catch-all, the asterisk at the end. And then it's just case backwards. So then, for Python, it would look like this. Um, it's, you know, you have to do a little bit more work, arguably, but it accomplishes the same basic thing. You're saying if, or, you know, else if, else if, and then the catch-all at the end instead of the asterisk like that, it's just an else. And then anything that doesn't get caught up in the first one, because the first true bails, so if it makes it to the last one, then, you know, that's the last thing it does, you know, depending on true or false. Functions are also kind of similar uh, to Bash. They use the def reserved keyword, and you can return items in Python because everything's an object. So it's very handy. So, so you can make a function, for instance, that does nothing more than you pass it something, it decides if it's true or false, and then returns true or returns false. So you can make a quick checker function that does nothing but evaluate whatever you've passed to it. And, you know, just little things like that make it very nice to use. Uh, here's, here's just a simple bash one, function hello world, and then you call it just hello underscore world. And that's what you do in bash. And then in Python, it's using def for definition, D-E-F, and hello world, and then the parentheses are important, of course. And when you call it, you also have to use the parentheses, unlike in bash. And, you know, we're kind of using the print with the parentheses there. That's a Python 3 thing, too. I didn't want to do it, but, you know, I wanted to be practical. I, I, so, had, to teach, I had to teach Nate that for the presentation. So. Yes. I was just like, whatever. But, you know, it's better to do it that way, arguably. If you do, yeah, if you don't want to go back and rewrite it when Python 3 comes in 10.10 .10 tabby cat or whatever. So, yeah. so <laughs> working with files, um, this is a lot of fun, but I'm going to let him handle that for me. I thought it was always 10 Grumpy Cat. Grumpy Cat, yeah, you're right, it's Grumpy Cat. My bad. He loves talking about Grumpy Cat. <laughs> uh, so we're going to work with files. Like, we do that a lot as system admins, right? You're always dealing with files. Don't you just love files? Love, oh, yeah, the file system is gone, you know? But that's what all we deal with. All right, so we're going to build files, and we're going to do some deal with path name components. And... To work with files, one of the first things we want to learn about how to do is joining paths. So Python uh, will automatically add path name separators if you use the particular command that I'm using up here. Um, the path name separators uh, are, are brought in with the OS path join uh, method, uh, and that um, will bring in platform native separators. So this is important for those of you who are working with a, uh, with Windows people, or, or uh, your team includes Windows people. So anybody dealing with Windows at all? I don't have to anymore. Um, and the nice thing is, is if your your team you know is is writing code that you want to be cross platform, this will help uh, help you with that. So it's a good concept to know. So I'm going to import the OS module. Um, I'm going to pick a variable name for uh, the most popular plugin on, on the internet, right? Silverlight. Um, and I'm going to join the, the path together. I'm going to start with slash uh, for root. Um, and I've got the backslash characters here as a continuation line so that this would fit on a slide. Um, you also want things to fit in your text editor. Uh, so um, it's good to know where, you know where you can break things with a backslash into a new line. Um, there are places where Python needs it and others where it doesn't. But uh, this is one place inside the parentheses that I need it. Uh, and then I'm basically constructing, uh, you know, uh, something akin to a list where I've got commas between the, the elements. So slash, and then library in the next line, internet plugins on the next line, and then the silverlight dot plugin uh, on the, the final line of that. And then if I press return to enter that, I do I make a print statement to uh, print that variable. Um, it will print this path. And then notice that library and internet plugins and silverlight plugins didn't have the slash there. It inserts that for me. 
This is really handy when you're constructing variables or reusing, you know, paths um, uh, within your scripts. So OS path join. Otherwise, this path is just a string. There's nothing other else special about it. I'm just showing you how you can get the path separators in there. Um, uh, when you're manipulating paths, which we do a lot, sometimes you need to know the name of the file. So just like in Bash, where you have the base name uh, uh, command, uh, you can use the same sort of thing in Python. That's OS path base name. And I'm pulling in the variable Silverlight plugin path, and that would that would uh, represent Silverlight dot plugin, that component of the the uh, the absolute path that I con uh, constructed earlier. Uh, dir name, I'm getting the directory portion of that path. So again, nothing ground chattering, um, but it's it's uh, you know just giving me functions that I might be used to from shell scripting. But one of the nice things you can do is some more um, detailed work with paths. So here I'm going to split the extension off of a file. So this is Safari's preference file. I'm sure that with all the things that have happened with Safari over the last couple of months, everybody's very familiar with this file. Um, and other things like XProtect. Um, so uh, I'm going to split the pa split the extension off and I get that extension as the second item um, in the output. So dot plist. It's a very efficient way to do this. Python is geared to do this. Um, if you're manipulating um, the paths for strings, there's often a method that gives you exactly what you want so that you don't have to construct your own way of stripping you know, text off, uh, off, off of a string or a path. Um, so in this case, just to let you know, this is giving me um, something I can refer to. Python does lists uh, as, as zero base, so this is the zeroth item and this is the first item. We are on the same wavelength. So good. And, and, yes. Yes, this would be it. Although I've heard people say tuple. I don't really know rightly how to pronounce that. So. Tomato, tomato. So I'm going to test files, because, you know, they test me. Um, does a path exist? What kind of object is it, that path? We do that a lot. We do, you know, if uh, and, uh, if uh, square bracket dash f or dash d in, in bash. So does a path exist? That's os.path.exist. Are you seeing a trend here with this os path thing? Um, so os path exists. I'm operating on that path, the Silverlight plugin path. This is the most you've dealt with Silverlight this whole year, isn't it? <laughs> Except that there was a security update for it, but the date seemed to be wrong. Um, anyway, so if I do that, the, the response from Python would be, that's true. I get a Boolean back. So I could use that in an if statement. If OS path exists, Silverlight plugin path, colon, you know, return true. And give me this. It's very handy. Yes, question? Mm -hmm. Again, zero is is false because it's empty. Any other number, whether it's positive or negative, would be true. Five is true. Your phone number is true. A string of characters is true. Kind of, it's very handy to know that because you can do some interesting things with if statements then. Um, if that's your sort of thing, everybody loves if statements, right? So OS path is dir. So the Silverlight plugin path, that's also true because the Silverlight plugin is a bundle in OS X, as we probably know um, or may need to learn. Uh, the uh, a bundle in OS X is a folder. And then we can find out if something is a link. Uh, so there's a couple different options for that in Bash. I believe the one I like is if dash H. I have to remember that one. Uh, and slash Etsy in the file system is a symlink. So this would re uh, return true. Globbing. You've probably used this in the shell. Um, we're using asterisks or other characters uh, for shell globbing. Um, the glob uh, method will return matching paths. Behind the scenes, it uses another module. It's not really important to you to know unless you really care and want to look that module up. Yeah, I like the name of it, though, effin match. That one's fun to say when you pop up over a cubicle. Uh, Glob. So it's going to import the glob module. 
you know, import module. There's lots of modules built in. This is built into to, uh, your OS X system. The OS X underbar install variable equals glob dot glob. Can I say globs enough times? Um, slash applications. Here I'm making a full path. Just I'm not I'm not using any other way to, to create the path. I'm just making it a string. Um, and then I've got the continuation character at, at the end of the line. And then install asterisk OS space x asterisk dot app. And I'm closing the parentheses. When I run that, the OS 10 underbar install variable uh, is a path containing those asterisks. And I'm going and glob will interpret it. Uh, and it will report back on my particular system that I have both the lion and mountain lion installers. So this is really handy to know if you need to match, um, you know, pass for a couple of different versions of maybe a creative suite that we might all have to deal with. So if you happen to need to find, for example, the Adobe Extensions Manager, which may be in almost the same relative path, but in uh, under CS5 or CS55 or CS6. So this is handy. Yes. It would return a list of only one, yeah, as I recall. And so you, um, so often if you're just looking for one out of this list, so you might want to use sort. Um, there's a sort method or a reverse, you know, to get the, you know, you might want to reorder the list to get what you want, or you know, just select I want the zeroth item. Or the other way you can refer to a list is if you want the last item in the list, you can use negative one. So I want the negative oneth item. That represents the last item. As I recall for glob, no. Yes. Yes. Somebody's probably typing help glob right now, right? So he can trip up the teacher. Um, version numbers. Uh, this is another handy object that's built into Python. Um, it's actually so popular it's built in twice, at least, um, in different ways. So the first way um, that, that um, some of us used, and I believe Monkey uses this, uh, is with the distutils.version module, distutils module, uh, the version submodule. Um, and that supports version objects. There's two kinds, strict version and loose version. And do you remember which monkey uses? Maybe not. We looked it up at one point. Yeah, I, I think it is too. That's what I would have guessed anyway. Uh, and the second one is setup tools.package underbar resources. Uh, and there's a parse, parse version method in there. And so let's use the first one. Uh, and we're going to import only part of the distutils module here, just to show you that we can do something like that. But some modules are very large. So I could have imported just OS path, as I recall, in the previous examples. But I, but I chose to import all of OS. Here I'm going to import just the version component of distutils. And I do that with from distutils import version. Um, and then in the next line, I do a, this is one line that continues version dot loose version and I'm doing 1041 so OS 10 version with the most version numbers you remember we went all the way up to 10411 turned it to 11 um, and then uh, I'm trying to see whether that's greater than uh, version strict version 10411 in this case alpha 4 so doing this kind of version comparison in another language that doesn't understand version objects would be very difficult right we've all seen these things where you're doing OS ver, you know, and then, you know, doing something with the output, and there's a lot of grep, and it's just, you know, balk and, you know, other caveman noises. Um, that's what the shell feels like with me, you know? Grep, awk, bash. Um, <laughs> so, this, in this case, this will return false, because, uh, 1041 is less than 10411. You can do the same comparison, and I'm getting even a little bit more crazy with the import here. From package underbar resources, that was the module, I'm going to import submodule, parse version, as v. So I'm going to set v, the variable v essentially, to represent the parse version component of this. Um, you will see this code. This is the reason why we're mentioning this. We want you to be able to read the code and know a little bit about what's going on. It doesn't mean you have to do this. So don't get scared by this line. 
Um, but then v represents that, that parse version component of the module. And so I say v and then 1041. Is that greater than v 10411 alpha 4? Again, this would be a, a similar hard comparison in a shell scripting language. That would return false again, just like it did on the last slide. Um, your mileage may vary with these, these two different ways of doing comparing version numbers. But. Yes. We've probably read the same thing on Stack Overflow. <laughs> oh, yeah, misconnection. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I find this, uh, it's a, it's a good way, um, this is, I, I find this to be a, a more interesting way. I just always forget to use it. Um, this utils is kind of in my mind because I, you know, saw it many years ago and started with that. I, I'm so hip I can't see over my pelvis. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so I don't really know the answer to that. Um, if you're importing more, you are taking up more system resources, but it's probably neg negligible. Um, for most purposes, I would say a case where it's a little bit less negligible, uh, or, or more of a problem is when you're running lots and lots of Python scripts in succession having to load the interpreter each time. So a case you might be familiar with, uh, uh, Casper Suite has extension attributes. And as I understand it, every time, you know, an extension attribute runs, it's its own, you know, it's its own script. It's, it's you know, pro opening up its own interpreter. Um, so, you know, you're, you're consuming those resources over and over again. So, you know, to the extent that the system coalesces things together and, you know, whatnot, you're probably helped out by the system. But I would say it's probably, probably better to, you know, in those cases to try to, to import the least amount possible. Like, you might want to import all of foundation if you're, if you're getting into the section Nate's gonna, gonna do. Yeah, back off. So, any questions before we go on? Because we've reached that section. Yes, we have reached that section. It was a good segue. It was a very good segue. I can see the next slide. So I'm sure this is technically wrong, and I'm sure someone will correct me on it. But you can run Objective-C-esque code in Python via a bridge. There's a bridge built into OS X that uh, translates uh, between the two. And it allows you to access, na access native methods for manipulating OS X, which can be very handy. I'll give you a really good example. This is something that you can use for an application, something that Monkey actually uses to read its own preferences. You can import from foundation, you would import CF preferences copy app value, and what this does is it reads the value of a key, and you have to tell it, of course, you know, which key, you know, which preference domain. So here we're going to set preference value equal to the value of auto backup out of the com.apple.time machine preference domain. And then as you can see, when we print it, it's true. So time machine set to do auto backup. And you can use this to read any plist. It's a native way of doing it. So there's a plist lib, and it only works on plain text plist files. But in OS 10, they're mostly binaries. So if OS 10 is interfacing with them, they're binaries, and Python can't just, you know, use that. But with this, you can because it's a native method and it works really well. Here is a pretty cool thing. It's, uh, you can get the screen resolution of a machine that's, you know, any client machine, and it's using AppKit. And it looks at the main screen, so you set the width, and there's this really long string. It's, you know, kind of confusing. Let me start from the right and go back to the left, because it's actually a little bit easier that way. You're looking for the width, uh, and, you know, it's the size.width, so it's the width of the screen on the main frame, so you know the frame that's actually being used, on the main screen of your machine using the NS screen object. So if you go you know, backwards, sometimes it's a little bit easier to read these things. And then height is the same exact thing, except when we drill down, we're getting the height instead of the width. And then we're saving those two as individual uh, variables, and then we're printing them, and you can print two at a time like that. So we have, you know, width come height, it's actually, you know, what, a 13 inch error, something like that. So you can get screen resolution if you're interested in that sort of information. Now, this is a very important thing that we do in Bash, and in um, and of course we have to do it in Python. You know, figuring out 
is what I just did working? Because I'm not quite sure. You know, I think it is, maybe not, I don't know. So we're, um, Jeremy's gonna actually go over this. It's using syslog, which is pretty sweet, and uh, some other fun stuff. Oh, yeah. I've never heard syslog referred to. Sweet, it is. It's very sweet. I find it to be a good way to get output of like your managed system to identify want to, or or if a something you import on computer, uh you can use to get to see or did something about and display the progress of the system. I'm making you talk.
and the process, at least as of PyCon 2, is you know, the way to do it. The way I would recommend. Um, and you can call all these external shell commands using a couple of different uh, functions. So, the process dot call is sort of the workhorse, or the workhorse, uh, for this. You're going to get a return code, um, as the output from that function. The process dot call, uh, will bring you a returning code or an exception. We didn't want to get into exception handling in this, in this discussion, and we don't do a lot of exception handling, especially not in Go. No, never. So, uh, just know that you can't get a return code out of it. You don't get the output of the return. Uh, and then the sub process check output function is this will give you the output string, uh, or an exception again. So if you want to get the output of commands, which you often do for the commands that Apple has built into the OI command, because instead of giving you exit code, they give you strings that you have to parse there, right? We've all dealt with this. So this is a convenient function to check output from one function to give you that output string when you set that equal to a variable. And do that in the moment. Okay, so actually getting the command into uh, any of those convenient functions of the self process model is a little bit a little bit interesting. Um, one of the hang ups I have uh, with the shell commands in Python. You have to list the the whole command as a string separated by where the white space is written. So uh, the example is I want to echo hello. I have to make a list in square brackets, uh, a string of echo, comma, string of hello. So that's an example of a list with a command that would do echo hello in the shell. Uh, and you can also call these uh, these convenient functions with using uh, with shell equals true uh, as one of the parameters of the command and uh, this is strongly discouraged by the documentation. Um, so we will strongly discourage this. We would feel strongly discouraged. Hope not. True. True. <laughs> you got to allow me to run to the side. So if, if you do happen to use Valley Hope Hope, you know what yes. you're doing in a safe way. But if you're rude, it's a bad idea. <laughs> See whether my account, Jeremy, is, it, is in the admin group. How many times you wanted to do that? That's a command that you can, you can use uh, over and over again to find out you know, whether your users are part of a particular group. Whether it's a directory service on the system or uh, their network directory system. Um, and so, you know, I can use this right in the shell if I want, but I'm going to do this in Python. So, again, just use the GS member, you fill a check member that my account is in the admin, admin group. Uh, it's very interesting to know, even if you're not using something. So then I'm going to say that the CMD variable equals, I'm going to use reference, refer to the object of that command. There's a command under our string, and I'm going to split. What split does is it takes that string and turns it into a list. So that I don't have to do all the stuff to make it a list myself. I don't like doing it. Uh, I don't like having to put it in the square brackets and comma and so on. And it's a lot, you know, I did it a couple of quotes, and now I have arthritis, so I think the less I have to type quotes, the better. And I want to put shift key. Oh, I'm sorry. Square bracket comes from work. Um, so then, uh, I can run this three different ways. Um, in, the, in the first way, uh, I'm going to get a return code variable, uh, for, that, that is the output of the subprocess dot call function. I'm going to run that, that CMD list. Has all of the commands. Um, so the, the return code would be, the call would be zero. For example, I'm going to do zero. 
Uh, and then the second, uh, I'm going to get the return code again. So I'll press check call using that same list. And the final way is I want to check the output. And that's going to be so process dot check output and then again that same command list. Now the only one of these that's really going to give you any information uh, because of the way this command works is the last one. Because this is one of those commands where Apple gives you the output you have to parse it and figure out is there is there some text in there. The other one will give you happily give you a return code as that variable threat code. Um, let's You'll get the same turn code whether I'm a member of that group. We'll both appear for this one. Yes, we will find you. Okay, fine. Have a drink. So learning's fun most of the time. Except for when it doesn't work. That's never fun, right? Um, yeah, it's mine. Yeah, it's so, yours. So uh, we want to share a couple of useful URLs. We have short URLs here for when you do have an internet connection. Uh, and and for you people on video, I'm sure you already have an internet connection because you're watching us on YouTube. It's true. Right? Uh, presenters, don't forget. So, um, so think Python. Um, it's one of the references I like to give out, especially to people who are brand new to Python. Um, this is a good introduction. It's written uh, really as a high school uh, course, uh, computing course. Uh, and so you know, I, I found that useful for myself and for giving out. Um, to students when I was working at the university. And Code Academy is very handy. Um, it's a web-based Python interpreter, and they have lessons that you can go through. So you start from very simple, you know, messing with strings, string addition, numbers, number addition, math, all that. Um, and uh, and then it gets more complex. You know, how do you make functions? How do you, you know, call them? How do you make classes? Which we didn't even cover. Um, but uh, it gets very complicated, and it gets really good. So you, it starts you simple. Takes you more complicated, and uh, it's really a great resource. So, dive into Python is another good resource uh, that's been out there for, for quite some time um, uh, from Mark Pilgrim, and it's um, a little bit more advanced if you're familiar with other uh, scripting or programming languages. Uh, this might be the kind of tutorial you want to go through. And then Python.org, of course. If you Google anything, Python. Subprocess, that's going to be the first thing that comes up normally. So you're just going to get the Python docs right away. If, so, if, if not, though, you'll get Stack Overflow. You'll get Stack Overflow, yeah, a lot of times. Now it is. And then learn Python the hard way is really good. If you learn by uh, repetition and doing it all hands on and just kind of here, do this, you know, sort of thing. It's uh, by Zed Shaw. And it's really good. And, you know, when it gets to more complicated things, he's like, okay, now read it. Now read it again. Now burn it into your mind, you know, that sort of thing. So if you, if you learn better that way, it's another good resource. I've been through both that and Code Academy, and they're both pretty good. But, you know, they're, they're more of an overview of Python, so it's not as specific to OS X, so you have to figure out how to adapt it. But it's, it's very good, uh, you know, principle uh, learning there on that. And then GitHub's a great resource. If you are thinking about making something, search before you make it, because it might already exist, and you may be able to just import it. Oh, you know. and, and another item about GitHub, there's also a lot of Python scripts that are on bitbucket.org. We didn't put that one up. Um, but uh, because um, the particular version control system that, uh, that uh, Bitbucket uses is very popular for Py Python people uh, over the years, um, you see code there as well. And, you know, and whichever you're using, it's easy to just clone a project, import it, use it, tweak it if necessary. And, you know, make sure you read their documentation if they have it. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, and make sure you understand it. You can probably see, determine which uh, side of the Git uh, versus Mercurial divide we're on here. <laughs> and then, of course, irc.freenode.net. I can't not pump this because this is, you know, the greatest channel in the entire world. But um, you're going to say something about AFP 540. No, no, not this time. Um, thank you. Uh, so the official Python channel is great if you just want help with basic, you know. Well, not basic, but general Python questions. And if you want specific questions about how do I do this on a Mac with Python, uh, you know, hash hash OS 10 server is a great resource. There's certain people that hang out on there that are really good at Macs and Python. So it's a very good mashup if you need help. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a great place to go. I also wanted to say, uh, you know, if you've never worked with Python before, it's just, you know, it's a great language to learn. And it's a little bit daunting at first, but don't get overwhelmed, you know, just, Start simple, then get more complex, and just keep iterating that. Yeah, there's you know. a lot of things you can do with the core language without doing any of the modules that we 
Yeah, you can do a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, just even simple scripts, put them up on GitHub, maybe someone will find it useful.